Nathaniel is a multi-award winning entrepreneur, um, international speaker, engineer, pilot, martial artist, uh, and a man of many talented achievements. He is a regular contributor uh, to TV, radio, and print stories that deal with social issues surrounding youth, uh, gender equality, youth crime, entrepreneurship, and renewable energy. Um, he's also attended and contributed to a number of youth delegates, uh, and serves the youth delegate in a number of international meetings and conferences at the highest level, including the G20, uh, guest group, in the European Union. He's the co-founder of Gen X Solar, which is an award-winning renewable energy company that operates in Africa and the Caribbean. Uh, he's also the chairman of Jamaicans Inspire UK, a Jamaican youth diaspora organization, a trustee board member to the EY Foundation, the Ernst Young Foundation, and the founder of the multi-award winning social enterprise, The Safety Box. In 2007, he was the first double award winner of the Enterprising Young Brits competition, 2008 signed feature, uh, and became a winner at the BBC's The Last Millionaire TV series, uh, which took 12 of Britain's most successful young entrepreneurs and dropped them into six of the world's most exciting and demanding cities to make money from scratch in just five days. In July 2011, uh, Mr. Pete received an honorary award from Cornell University as the alumnus of the year. In 2013, he was invited to become an FRSA fellow and was the winner of the UPF Youth Achievement Award. In 2015, uh, Pete was the only UK entrepreneur selected by Virgin Unite to attend a week-long leadership gathering at Necker Island with Sir Richard Branson. Pete was honored in June 2015 by King's House where he received the Governor General Award for Excellence from Sir Patrick Allen. In 2016, he was listed in the UK Financial Times uh, as one of the upstanding top 100 black ethnic minority executives in the US, UK, and Ireland. He was ranked 17th. And on October 26th, Mr. Pete was entered into the 2017 UK Black Power List and was recognized in the Financial Times Top 100 Ethnic Minority Executives. Can I please ask you for a round of applause in introducing our speaker? And I, I, I hate all of that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you just came up and said, hey, this is Nate. <laughs> Nathaniel, because the thing is, all right, um, it's not about all of that stuff, all right? The journey, I, I'll talk about the journey of, of all of that, but I want you to start your brains on this idea that profit is not bad. Everyone say profit is not bad. Profit is not bad. Profit is good. Profit is good. Profit with purpose is even better. And so I want you to reframe your thinking and take your mind away from non-for-profit because non-for-profit can't actually do anything by itself. Without cash flow, you're unable to impact lives. But it's profit with purpose that enables you to do stuff. And so reframing the thinking, you now have in your mind profit with purpose. So when you're beginning, let's say, a business, the core of your business now should have the frame of social impact built directly into the business at the point of the beginning of that business. The problem that we've got is the world is moved heavily by charity. And there's, there's different types of charity aid which you find humanitarian aid, you've got disaster aid, you've got systematic aid. And of course, disaster aid and humanitarian aid is really good. You know, we've had hurricanes in Texas, people are going out of their way to assist those guys in the flooding. We've had urban the storms in the Caribbean and in Florida, and people are going out of their way to help them. They're giving of their own time, they're giving of their own goods, they're giving clothes, they're giving food, and that's good. The problem that exists is that when charity becomes a systematic system, it can actually become quite bad in that you have a person that is continually built into this way of receiving. And so where you've got, let's say, a village in Indonesia or Cambodia or in, in Africa, let's say, in Ethiopia, and they're continually given something. What happens after a while is they become dependent upon the give. 
And the generation below that then becomes dependent upon the gift. And the generation below that becomes dependent upon the gift. And of course, what that leads to then is dead aid. Because now the people are not empowered, but they're simply reliant upon somebody which is giving. Which is why in this generation, we've really got to reframe this thinking of charity. To build a better world, you actually have to have this model of social entrepreneurship, social innovation, which leads to profit with purpose. Charity, dead aid. There are more and more and more charities which pop up every single day. They oftentimes do the same thing. How many youth crime violence organizations do you know in Virginia? Be interactive. <laughs> Be interactive. Um, there's a lot, right? There's a lot. And how many people lose somebody, let's say, due to breast cancer or another cancer and they set up a trust or a foundation? There's many, right? And you see, there are more and more charities, but there are less and less donors for those charities. Because now what happens is you've got 10 of the same thing. Which one do you give to? It's like a whole row of water bottles on the shelf. Which one do you buy? 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 It depends. So you measure up the cost and you measure up the value, the personal value, and you're going to donate to that charity, probably that looks the most sexy. Probably the one that looks the best. The website looks organized. The, 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 the links are good. You know, you're not going to dead links on the website. The pictures look good. The graphics are great. But you know what? That charity might actually not be doing the grassroots work that the other charity is doing that perhaps doesn't have a stronger website presence but they're actually doing more grassroots work with greater impact. So the money is spread. The donations are getting less and less. And what does that mean in terms of sustainability? It means the cash flow is not there. When you've got a government now that has no money, when you've got a government that is cutting back the sustainability that's found within those charitable organizations is limited because the grants now, you can't get the same volume, you can't get the same amount of money, the donations are not coming in, or you're competing against multiple charities that are doing exactly the same work. Which is why now, it's important for this generation of millennials to think about business, to think about whatever they are interested in, making that a profitable organization that has social good. This is this concept of social enterprise, social entrepreneurship. So I've got to talk a little bit about my journey because these types of accolades that were read don't come through without a struggle. <laughs> And it's important, I think, in terms of empowering, in terms of, in terms of motivating, in terms of inspiring. I think it's important that the journey is actually shared. And, and I grew up in the area of North London, it's known as Tottenham. Uh, my heritage is Jamaican, so if I change the way I speak, and I'm, I'm kind of a bit more kind of lost. You get me like, I'll walk like this, and I'll say, oh, yeah, good? Yeah, man, cool. And I change my accent, and I begin to walk, and I talk differently, and I'm going into an inner city community in London whereby there are levels of institutional racism in the school. And I went into school, in fact, with a very good level in mathematics. But when I went to my secondary school, um, the teacher that was teaching me um, had a perception of black boys. And it meant that I didn't do so well because the work wasn't challenging my mind. I went in with a high level of mathematics, and when I was in the class, I didn't feel as though the curriculum was stimulating me. My mom, my dad went into the, into the school, they, they spoke to the teacher, they, 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 they had words with the, with the teacher, and they said, you know what, please can you give our son better work? I got disengaged with the curriculum. By the time I got to um, the ninth, is it ninth grade? That's about kind of 14, yeah? I was completely disengaged with maths. I started to hang out with the wrong people. 
To put it short, I didn't get the grades I needed to get into the further education to do what's known as the A-levels, which is the access kind of grades that you need to go on to do university. And I fell short. You need at least a minimum of five, including English, maths, and science. I got four, and I failed maths, and I failed science. I got English because my English teacher said, recognizing our disengagement with the curriculum, said we will pay us 100 pounds if we pass. Everybody in the class passed English. <laughs> About seven friends dead, others in prison. Uh, 16, I'm, I'm doing things I shouldn't be doing. And I'm disengaged. My dad said he's a strong Jamaican guy. And he said, if you don't, you don't get in the college, then Baba Kiko, the host. So I knew that my dad was serious, and I went to one college. I couldn't get into that college. College is not the same like university. College is the one below, right? So I, I went to one. They said, you don't have the grades. I went to another. They said, you don't have the grades. I went to another. They said, you don't have the grades. You're going to have to repeat your exams. I went back to my school. My school didn't want me. And I remember my friend got a letter, an acceptance letter from one college in London. And I remember his, um, his acceptance letter and we, we hustled our way into the college and he went and he showed the security guard and he passed it back to me and I showed the security guard and I got into the college. I always had this, always had this idea that I wanted to be a pilot. At the time I had this kind of baseball cap. Um, I was, it was the socks, you know the socks? Yeah, we used to have these big team jackets and these hats and we were really into the hip hop culture, like the rap culture, we were really into it in the UK, right? And so, I had this swagger, so I'm walking, I got this swagger, I'm walking with this bounce. And I remember, I always wanted to be a pilot, I wanted to fly airplanes, that was my ambition as a young boy. And I went, and I queued up in the A-level physics line without maths or science. <laughs> And I remember I sat down <laughs> and I queued up for a whole hour because it was a row of students. And I got to the front and this guy looked at me. And I didn't look like the guy who took an A-level physics. <laughs> I looked completely different from the guys behind me who had like glasses, dressed nice, I had a baseball cap, and I just had gold jewelry and everything. I just looked different. I had my eyebrows marked and <laughs> man, I just looked different. And I sat down and I remember the guy looked at me, almost with a smirk on his face, and he said, can I see your grades? And I passed him the slips, and he flicked through, and he, he, he didn't see maths, he didn't see the sight, he didn't see anything. And he said, I'm sorry, you don't have to grade, you're going to have to repeat your GCSEs. So I kind of got up, and I walked up again, I'm like, like Chuck, oh, I can't bother to this, man, I'm going to leave, like, Chuck. And I remember what was happening outside, you know? You know, friends are getting shot, there's stabbings, there's, ha there's things happening. And I went back again, and I queued up for another hour. So I've been there for two hours now, plus the... Plus trying to deliberate whether I'm going to go back or not. I went back again. The guy said to me at the end, say you don't have the grade, you're going to have to repeat your exams. You don't have the grade, you're going to have to repeat your exams. And he said it, not like that, but he said it in a very aggressive way, as in, you don't deserve to be here. In his eyes, he spoke to me, you don't deserve to be here. You don't deserve to, his eyes said to me, you don't deserve to be here. And I got up and I walked again. Around, I'm like, I need to go into this program because friends, my friends, you know, friends, you know, it's, it's rough. There are gangs, there's things going on, and, I, and this was my opportunity because I've been rejected from colleges. I just managed to get into this one. I hustled my way in, and I queued up for another hour, got to the front, and the man says, you don't have the grade. You're going to have to repeat your exams. And the head of the department was sitting next to him, and it was Anita. I will never forget Anita. She said, sit next to me. I sat next to her, and she said this, I've seen him come back three times. Anyone with that level of determination and drive, I'm sure won't be able to do an A-level in physics. I sit on the senior management, and I'm also the head of the department of physics, and I'm gonna give you a call. And she typed up a letter for me, and she said, look, take this and tell another A-level, because you need two A-levels to be here in this college. Tell them that I sent you, and take this. I'm gonna accept you onto your A-level in physics, as long as you repeat your GCSE mathematics and go and tell them over there you're going to do a repeat and I sent you. So she saved my life, literally, because I managed to do my A-level in physics and I went on and I did 
my foundational engineering degree, then I did a mechanical and aeronautical engineering degree, and I went on and I did a MSc in advanced systems engineering. Basically, it meant that I could design these engines, I could make these things. I was involved in engineering. I wasn't bad at maths, it's just the maths was taught to me wrong. It wasn't relevant. I needed stuff to be practical for me. It didn't mean I was bad, but I always had this ambition. I wanted to fly airplanes, qualified pilot. But it cost a lot of money to do that. I came out, I lived in Florida, I did my uh, ATPL, I went back to the UK, I did my ATPL airline transport pilot's license. And in order to do that, I had to use my skill sets. So I'm a 50 degree black belt in uh, Okinawa Judo Kat Go Jeru, martial arts. I'm a trained expert in trained expert in martial arts. <laughs> what I was doing at university was I need the money to become a pilot because it costs a lot of money. And I came from a community in an area where we couldn't afford to spend 130,000 pounds. Not dollars, pounds. And so what I said is I'm gonna use my skills to try to make money. But I'm gonna use my skills to create leaders, not students. Because if I can create a leader, it means the leader can go and open their own school and I can get residual income from the leader that I'm training up. So what I did is I said, all right, I'm going to train you guys at five pounds per hour. And I had 30 people in the class. That was 150 pounds for one hour. I thought, let me do two hours. That was 300 pounds. I thought, let me do another class, two hours. That was 600 pounds. When I did a weekend class, I now had three classes with the toddlers, with the 10-year-olds, and with the teenagers. I could make anywhere between six to 900 pounds a week. That would basically be added to my, that was the weekend plus added to the week earnings, which would total 1,200, 1,400 sometimes pounds a week at age 18. And I began to bank that. And so you have this idea of empowerment of other people, which then brings a result. The greatest significance in life isn't found from how much money you make, the car you drive, the house you live in. The greatest significance in life is found through service. When you can basically give a good service, someone will pay for that service. When you're empowering somebody else, then you get the return, you get the loyalty. When you do good for somebody, you get the return on the investment. And so these guys went on and they achieved great success. In fact, four times national champions because it was a mindset of excellence. Once you have a mindset of excellence, you can achieve. And this this kind of talk today is, is kind of merged into social entrepreneurship and empowering innovation and, and trying to push you guys into a position whereby you now think on an excellent level. When you think of an, on an excellent level, then it transitions to everything that you do. Four times national champions. We've had guys that have gone on to compete at world championship level. In fact, in Team GB, four members came from my team across institutions, all of the institutions in the whole of the country. Four members, the team size was 16. I was hard growing up in central London playing the violin, sorry, in North London playing the violin, trying to be a rude boy, carrying my violin, and doing a rude boy dance with my violin. But I managed to get to a good level, and I got a music scholarship at university where I managed to play the violin, and I was earning money through teaching people how to play the violin and also the saxophone. And I started a company called The Safety Box, Social enterprise based off of my own experience. My own experience was there was something inside of me that the teachers couldn't see. There was something that was there that was saying, to, saying that, you know what, I was, I was good at maths, I wasn't bad at maths, but the, the curriculum was delivered to me the wrong way. So we developed this program, the safety box. We've had a measured impact of over 8,000 young people in the United Kingdom. We've also worked in prisons where we've We've managed to reduce the levels of violence in one of the most violent youth prisons in the country by 94.6% in one year because of a mindset shift. Did you hear what I said? Did you hear what I said? Yes. And so, results like this have never been seen before in the UK, in the UK prison, because it had many other drops. We modeled something in, in Chicago to do that. Took it to Jamaica. So Prince Harry basically met two of the young people that were awarded down there with the Diana Princess of Wales Memorial Charity. Got two awards for enterprise and entrepreneurship in 2007, as you heard before. First black person, first person under 30 to get that. That's the 
former Prime Minister of the UK, Gordon Brown, or the former former, right. former, former <laughs> Prime Minister. <laughs> first black person to get that under 30 years old. First person to get two awards. The Daily Mail, which is quite a conservative newspaper, called us six of the best. Been inside of magazines, been on the front of magazines. BBC called us and said, look, we need a program in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in other countries, the BBC last one in there, where we basically were taken and had to start a business from scratch in another country. Been on television a bunch of times, way all over the place. G20 Summit, as you know, roundtable discussions, as was discussed in Powerless, 2011, honorary medal at Grinnell University, and then I wanted to do something for the Olympics, and <coughs> again, this is just social entrepreneurship again. An example of it, we, we had these phone cases. Remember the phone cases that you can get to cover your phones? And I wanted to create something that would ensure that we could actually support athletes that are coming up. And so what we did is we created a phone case branded with the Team Jamaica on it. And we managed to network it into the Olympics without paying any money. <laughs> We networked in, and we got endorsement from this guy uh, through a middle name, not through a first name or a last name, because people understand hearts and minds. Hearts and minds connect more than cash, sometimes. <laughs> We're the right people. And basically, Richard put the, picked that up, in fact, and put us in his book, Secrets That Don't Teach You at Business School. Because these are things that you don't learn at business school. These are things that you learn. And this is the power of networking. The reason why I'm here is because of a power networker connected with me. This is why within this room, now you can collaborate together. You guys are all social innovators. You're from several different sectors. There's two guys sitting next to each other. One's in the bio athletic, biomechanic area. One's in the psycho. Um, uh, the other side, one is the, one is the brain, one is the body. This collaboration right here, you've got another person, what do you do, what, what's your sector? Education. Education, now, so what you have is collaborative work immediately. And this is the power of networks, and this is how you create social change. Because when you've got one person which is leading, connecting with other people that want to lead or have their own thing, you marry it together, and what you have is social change. You're aligning your thoughts, your processes to move forward. And, and so, featured on the front of magazines, exceptional magazines, board member of Ernest and Young to pivot greater changes. So, the foundation, when we went to EY, we said, look, you need to do more for young people. So, we launched the foundation that is to get young people that are not in employment into work. So that youth that ordinarily don't get the grades can have an opportunity to do an apprenticeship with a business. And you've seen, you've heard this already. This is, I'm just giving you credibility. It's just in case you didn't read my bio. So, so I've got credibility to talk to you about the other stuff. So I've featured two times now in this list. First entry in 2016, second entry in 2017. And this year I'm the black powerless of Britain's most influential black people. And this kind of brings me to where I am now. Because I've seen the problems, and this is Africa at night time. There's hardly any power there. There are 650 million people that don't have power in Africa. What does that mean for many people? Young people use these kerosene lanterns, which are dangerous. In fact, if you get kerosene on your hand, it causes irritation. If you breathe in the fumes, it can cause respiratory problems with your lungs. There's deaths, a number of deaths is attributed to that. There's, a, there's burns units in many hospitals. Why? Because children knock over the lanterns and they burn themselves. In this 21st generation, that shouldn't happen. So this is essentially what we're doing at GenX. Empowerment, electricity, and innovation. 1.25 billion people around the world have no power. And that's a startling figure, of course, when you look at places like India, 
Eu queria ouvir a Snafka. That's simply unacceptable. We don't start to tackle climate change, which is a real problem. You look at what climate change has caused. Doctors can't perform life saving operations for energy, where vaccinations go off, where baby incubators simply go off. They die. What happens? What do you do? And it's come to me is limited access to radio, to the internet, to education that is online. They don't have the same opportunities, but oftentimes they have the ability. What we do is we teach and train women, young people, how to innovate and how to design that are disengaged with the curriculum, disengaged with maths and science. They learn how to build some of our products, like solar lanterns. We've done it all over the place. Now you put them at the forefront in Africa where women don't have the same opportunities as men. Or it's disproportionate. Teach the women how to install and how to put together and how to build. And the whole drive is to end energy poverty. Because when you can end energy poverty, then it means that we have sustainability. It means that a local business now has the ability to stay on, keep the power on. Do you know what it means like to keep the power on? Imagine you've got a local business and you've got five computers that go dead and it's dead for three days. There's no power for three days. What happens to industry? It's halted. And you have multiple enterprises now that have no energy. What does that mean to the economy? Because SMEs are the backbone of the modern economy. And so if the SMEs go dead, what does it mean for the economy of the country? And so this is what we're doing. We're pivoting. We're genetics. We manufacture also solar cells. This is a solar charger for all of our devices. So you can plug your phone into this and uh, power your phone. Keep your phone on. So we've been incubated quite heavily by Virgin, in fact. And my business partner is 26 years old. She's the CEO of an international company at Sir Richard's House in Oxford. And former Prime Minister, see what we do. When you actually begin to network a certain way, when you start to move a certain way, social entrepreneurs, when you start to create change with what you're doing, egos that want to create greater change will want to associate with you. And you learn then to broaden that entrepreneurial space, to link with the right type of individuals which help you then to grow. And so that was our neck Island. In fact, the, the house is completely devastated now, unfortunately. We've empowered many people on the ground in in Kenya, teaching them how to install many of our products, and the kids go around selling the power now. So you put it into a rural village, and they'll go up and say to somebody who's a business person or a local farmer, hey, do you want to charge your phone? Uh, okay, five shillings. <laughs> <laughs> and so you have empowerment, but then the knowledge behind the tech, in fact, we're doing a project in Tanzania, I just came back from Tanzania, uh, went to the UK, stopped up in the UK quickly, and came to the States, and we're going to be empowering a rural village, 500 homes, and we're building a renewable energy center right in the middle of the Rift Valley, where there's hardly anything, where they're going to learn how to assemble and build and then install in the local area. There's no power there. So we're beginning with 500 homes, it's going to stem to others. And so you've got a very thin line between success and failure. When you're talking, this gives me credibility to talk to you now, right? All right? <laughs> you've got a very thin line between success and failure. Can I take two people? Just two volunteers, please. Okay, one, two. Okay, great. Give them a round of applause. I want you to stand back to back. Stand back to back. Put your hands up, just like this. Put this on like this, sorry. Like this, great. Okay, now you're gonna spread the hands slightly. Now you can see the angle here, that's the apex, top of the triangle. Yeah? Any mathematicians here? You're a mathematician. Kind of. That's, that is called the apex, right? That's the apex. I know it's the apex. Totally. All right, great. So what happens now? Can you see where your hand is? Can you see where it's pointing? I want you to stand where your hand's pointing. Just go and see. Yeah, so go like right to the extent of the line. Go right. Away. You've got to walk through the people. So let's imagine, imagine that the line's going through the people. Great. 
Break on steps. Get further over. No, 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 no. Hold here. That's where you were. There. That's it. Good stuff. Break. Now, your angle. Is that an angle still? Did you angle it? Yeah, okay, great. Okay, so now you walk over there. Go and stand where you are. Over the All right. You've got to go through the, Imagine you're going through the people and you're standing right over there where that chair is. Just there, just there. There you go. Good stuff. Stop. Okay, now the distance between these two guys is significant. The reason why the distance is significant with the one that is successful and the one is, that is not successful is because of the network. Do you believe me? You can put your hands down, by the way. It's because of the network. It's because of who she knows and who he knows. Which comes back down to, you can sit down now, give him a round of applause, please. It's just, it's just to illustrate. It's just to illustrate the importance at this point. When you begin on your journey, if you do not have the right skill sets, the right team players, the right partners, it is highly unlikely that you're going to get the trajectory that you need. And you're going to be constantly grasping for funds, constantly reaching to try to find people to give you the help. But when you start from the very beginning, integrating the right people into your team, you have the ability to be successful. Now, you want to create social change, it means that you have to have people that think socially. It means that the humanitarian or the person that's in the social science department now works with the business department, now then works over them in the technology department, and you have got the ability to do the networking right now, right here. Because some of the greatest innovators are in university. And so you've got the graphic designer here, you've got the engineer here, you've got the management, you've got the educator, you've got the Exactly, you've got the physical education. And so when you begin to network with the same social type of cause, you begin to integrate your team that enables you to then become successful. And so that line between success and failure within social innovation, within social change, begins with the social ecosystem. It is that social entrepreneurship ecosystem. So it's about actually beginning to develop your entrepreneurial ecosystem to create the social change. Being in the social innovation section of Virgin Unite has enabled us to connect on other levels. Being connected to a particular group of individuals has enabled us to go further to push boundaries. And for you now, if you want to now create a social change, if you want to become a social entrepreneur, you've got to integrate the right people into your right ecosystem. You cannot do it alone. You've got to do it with others. Co-founders, really successful over single founders of companies. When you have a good team, you're able to then scale, you're able then to do more. It is not about, it's not about who you know, it's about who knows you. When you're developing that, did you hear what I said? It's not about who you know, it's about who knows you. When you, okay, you get that? You got it? Okay, okay, good. It's about doing something that is disruptive enough to get other people engaged. And so, when you've got your team, when you've got your people that are thinking the same way with the same type of vision, you integrate those people into your team, you then get the flow. People are thinking the same way, people are doing the same thing, people are aligned in the same bandwidth. You're able to then do more. So thinking about social entrepreneurship now, applying this type of model helps you to move forward. You're talking about empowerment. Everyone stand up for a moment. Unless you've got a camera. <laughs> okay. I want you to shake. Just shake your body up. Shake your body. Okay, move your legs. Move your legs. Sit down. <laughs> it's the end of the day. You've had class the whole time. I'm getting you moving. I'm getting you moving. Adrenaline. Now, it's talking about movement. You can't make footprints in the sand of time sitting down. You have to get up and move. You've got to be able to move when other people are not moving. 
You have to be able to move when other people are not moving. And you have to get into the frame of commercial business mind with a social cause. Because with a commercial business mind, you're going to push, 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 push. And you've got to get into this thinking that somebody else is doing the same thing as me. And when, they're sit when you're sitting down, they're moving ahead of you. And it's a race. And you have to be hungry. So you're finding others equally as hungry. Motivation. Getting up and moving. You cannot make footprints in the sand of time sitting on your butt. You've got to get up and move. And the discipline that you have is the bridge between that goal and that accomplishment. And so many people have these goals. What stops them from actually reaching it, that destination as an accomplishment, is lack of discipline. So within the space of social entrepreneurship, again, discipline has to be a forerunner because it's going to be incredibly difficult. It's not an easy space to operate in. You're going to get knocked back because people are not going to believe in your idea. And so this is where you've got to get up. You've got to move. You've got to be disciplined. And surround yourself with the people that think the same way. I always have a statement which I've read somewhere, which is if you associate with chickens, you're never going to fly with the eagles. And I wear a golden eagle. Eagles are different birds. And it encounters that cumulus nimbus cloud, which is a towering rain cloud. As a pilot, you avoid those things like anything because it has these horrible things called microbursts which shoot out of the base of the cloud. And as it's rising, you stay clear of those cumulus nimbus clouds. But the thing is, with eagles, what they do is simply shift their wings, adjust their body, and rise above it. I want you to do that. Sh say shift. shift. Oh, say shift. shift. And wait to move your body. Shift. Say shift. shift. All right, get your wings ready. Adjust. Adjust. Are you guys entrepreneurs? <laughs> Come on, I want more energy than this, man. Like, shift. 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 Adjust. Adjust. I'm going to say rise above it. I'm going to give you the opportunity at the end to say rise above it, but you can do whatever you want to do to rise above it. Put your hands up or stretch your wings, but we're not going to do it now. But when I get to the end, I want you to do the shift, adjust, and rise above it. That's the attitude you've got to have. Shift, adjust, and rise above it. You've got to shift, adjust, and rise above it. Where you've got a president here that's mashing down renewable energy and doing all this stuff, you have to shift, adjust, and rise above it collectively. Has anyone watched Planet of the Apes? Oh, yeah. And you see when he goes, what a week. <laughs> Do you remember that part? Who hasn't seen it? Just went over your head. <laughs> you need to watch it. All right, there's a time of the moon, right? When he's talking to a baboon. <laughs> and, I mean, and Caesar basically has a stick, and he kind of he puts the stick as a signal, then he puts it together, and it's hard to break. That's the concept I'm trying to get across in terms of innovating together pulling the right people into your team. So you've got, you're a social scientist, but you've got an engineering idea. That means connect with the engineer that wants to do social good. Find someone that is better at doing it than you. And don't be frightened of them taking the idea, but integrate them directly into your team. There's only one place you're gonna find success before work, and that is in the dictionary. <laughs> he just got it. <laughs> he just got it. So wait, I was counting one, two, three. <laughs> just, I just got it. All right, good stuff. Do you know, sometimes I've, I've, I've done this slide at some and other places, and I, I've gone onto the next slide, and I've heard someone laugh in the back, and they take the whole slide for them to get to the point. Of course, the, the S comes before the W only in the dictionary. You have to work. The work is a key component in social entrepreneurship. I'm really, I'm, I'm stressing this social entrepreneurship. Really, it's not an easy thing to do. But once you get it working right with, with profit, you have to have a purpose. So when you focus on the profit, then you can do more with the purpose. You can stretch. When you're working as a collective, when you're working together, you can create a disruptive change. And part of the reason why I was invited to Necker Island was because there were social innovators 
world changers that were on the island, and there was 20 of us, brought together as leaders in our game to try to work together to create social change. That's why it was referred to as a leadership gathering. And so now you begin to create these little hubs of leadership gatherings within your space. Look at this entrepreneurial hub. You know, I've been to rural villages in Africa. I went to, I could even show you on my phone after we have some refreshments of a, of a, of a guy that's built a biogas station in his farm. There is no power and he's just created from the dung from the cows. He's read a book and he's basically built a biogas facility that he uses for cooking. Amazing. Amazing. And that's collaborative efforts of people that are local. The guy that does the, the metal and the person that has a little bit more technical understanding of, of, uh, of fluid, well, we refer to in engineering as fluid mechanics, but they're, they're not, you know, they're, have, they're not having an engineering degree, but they're a mechanic. And then coming together in, collaborative, in a collaborative way to actually build something that is it's going to change lives. That does change lives. It's changed this whole family's life. And so you're now looking at this angle again of success and failure. But you've got a plan. You've got an action plan. Without the plan, it's hard for you to get to your destination. Without the roadmap, it's very difficult. Let's imagine we don't have a GPS. I want you to take, can you guys drive me to Montreal, please? From here. You can do it. Absolutely. Are you from Canada? No, I've been there. You've been there. <laughs> there. Who has never been to Canada before? All right. Can you drive to Canada from here in Virginia without a map? So why on earth without the fuel? Without the snacks? <laughs> without the music? <laughs> <laughs> it's the same thing with social entrepreneurship. You cannot begin the journey of social entrepreneurship without the right equipment. It means you need to upskill. The three, there's three pillars that you need, that, that you must have, that you must have in your entrepreneurial um, walk. These three pillars, skills, Skills, and you reinvest back into the skills. You have partners, and you have your team. Thank you. Partner. <laughs> Thank you so much, partner. Thank you so much. And then you have your people. Can you read the others? Success, yeah? Now, to put this in a practical sense, okay? Just to put this in a practical sense. We're at university and you're struggling. You're struggling to pay your fees. You're struggling to, see, to, to pay your fees. <laughs> you're, strugg you're struggling to pay your fees. And you're struggling to pay your fees. All of you are struggling to pay your fees. So what you do is you go and get a job in 7-Eleven, and then you're earning how much per hour? How much? Seven dollars per hour. But you're a designer, you're a graphic designer, and you could be earning fifty dollars an hour. Right? Yeah? Correct? And so what you do now is you now, in your social innovation, go and find everybody on your course. That is a hundred students, maybe. How many classes do you have that one? Fifty? Twenty? Yeah, fifty. 30, 30, 30. All right, so we get half, which is 15 that want to be in on this project. And the head of the Strong Entrepreneurship Center says, we need to get some flyers made up. And they want to save money. They don't want a design company to do it. So what you've got, as you, the social entrepreneur, that's empowering other people on your course, you say, I can design that for you. And so you take the work. And what happens is the Strong Entrepreneurship Center collaborates with Humanities Department, who actually collaborates with Hampton University over here, Media Department. And so what happens is we've got now the, the workload of the entrepreneur that is empowering other entrepreneurs, plant-based building. 
And so now you've got your business at university. It's what I was doing at Brunel University. Yeah? You've got your business that is running through doing a discounted service for the university. And you're empowering all the other students to do the other work and you're taking some money off the top. So here what you've got is now, are you tired? You okay? What you've got now is $50, which is being charged here. You're paying these guys $40 and you're taking the $10 profit. And you're reinvesting that back in. And you're running training programs. You're running some training programs to upskill your guys in web development. Okay? Or something else. And what happens then is you're building the skills base and then the university wants to save money on printing and they go to you and they say to you, hey, can you print? And of course you can't print, can you? You're a student. You don't have a printing facility. So you go out to the stores and you say, listen, I can provide you with regular business. I can give you at least 10 print jobs every week. Can you give me a discount? How much can you give me? What can you give me off? I'll give you a $5 discount. The university goes to the print store and they charge them $50, but when they go to you, it's only $45. Who are they going to go with? You. So that's the partners that you've linked in. Partners that you're linking in. You've got your team to build a bigger workforce. And now you're reinvesting everything back into the skill development, upskilling people, and giving them more skills. And that is, again, that's a social initiative that you're doing because you're helping students to afford their university costs, their fees, maybe their living costs, maybe they can supplement their food costs. You're following me? And now you then get people people to begin to talk about your service. You get testimonials, you get, there was a company that I was mentoring once, in fact, they, they had this, uh, this drink and the, the actual shop um, got the drink and they stopped the drink that they were making. I said, get all of your people, members of your church, members of your family to go and buy the drink. So they went and bought the drink and of course they sold out. And so what did they do then? They made another order. So you get people to talk about what you're doing. You're social. You can save a lot of money and start a business on a shoestring budget by just doing free advertising on YouTube. It's a much more powerful way of getting the idea across when you can show video instead of a long proposal. And it's very difficult, in fact, to sell the idea and the concept if you don't have some type of graphics. And so where you've got this model, skills, partners, team, and people, you then have an equation for success. And so I'm kind of winding down. I'm going to leave the platform open for, for questions. Um, but I want you to think about aspiring to inspire before you expire. This is a statement which I continually use. And the, the topic started, aspire higher. But really, I want you to aspire to inspire before you expire. That's a place that you need to be. You guys can and have and do have the skill sets to create social change for good. When you inspire somebody else, they in turn inspire you back. And you're growing and this momentum and this movement begins to spread. So thinking now about problems, situations, circumstances, not having the finance, maybe not even having the startup capital. I want you to think about this in your mind. And we're going to say this as I wind down, leave it open for questions. I'm going to go back to the concept of the eagle and the golden eagle. So I want you all to do this with me. I want you to shift your body. You ready? <laughs> no, no, I'm back to I have to. <laughs> that's, the, that's the problem. Honestly, that's the problem. Like sometimes it's effort. But it's effort that you need. Man, it's only the guys that have got effort. That it's only the guys that get up when everybody wants to sit down that create the social change. You've got to move. You've got to move. It's hard. And so it's like a train. You know, you get those big, strong guys, right, that pull these strongman competitions and they pull the trains. And it's like the train is there. They're like trying to pull the train and they're like moving really slow at the beginning. And they're trying to get this thing moving. And then once you actually get into a flow, the momentum and the inertia takes over and the laws of physics allow you to pull this thing gracefully because the momentum is moving. And so this is about shifting, adjusting, and, and, and rising above it. Shifting, adjusting, and rising above it. When you lock that into your mind 
And when you continually say that over and over and over again, I'm going to make it, I will. I'm going to integrate the right type of people into my team. You're speaking life every time with your words, speaking life, speaking excellence, speaking success every single day. You then will make it, I guarantee it. Put the work in. Integrate the right people into the team. Create your pillars and then start having the action. And once that action begins to vibrate, you create a disruptive social change. And that then is social entrepreneurship. Impacting lives, changing people, lifting them up, not knocking them down, not taking, but serving. Remember what I said about service? Powerful. Powerful stuff. Thanks for watching. If you like what you saw, make sure to follow at Strom EC to tune in next time.